Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Edmundo Resendez. On today's Fronteras, we take a look at the story of Native Americans. In the following story, we take a look at how Native American students at a Wisconsin high school still have to deal with ignorance and hate speech. I am a part of the Ho-Chunk Nation. I am Native American and I am part of the Ho-Chunk and the Pima tribes. High school students Cami Thundercloud and Moses Decora have been targeted by hate speech. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there were 867 incidents reported in the 10 days after the 2016 presidential election. This has made Cami and Moses more aware than ever of the ever-growing hate in our country and more concerned for their safety. Since the election happened, I hear a lot more derogatory language being used against natives, Mexicans, everybody. But once I leave, here, people don't know how to identify me. I've been called a lot of different derogatory terms, including a wetback, border hopper, bean, <laughs> chola, like oop, that kind of stuff. It's not really cool. I was walking around in a park one day, and this guy started speaking Spanish to me, and at the time I was still in a Spanish class, so I said, no hablan espanol, and then I was like, dude, I'm, I'm not Mexican, I'm Native American. I try not to call people out about it like if i get called asian or anything i'm like oh by the way i'm not just gonna be like hey don't call me that because i'm not really offended by it i'd like to properly get <laughs> identified as what i am which is native american because i'm proud of that even though this issue is a very difficult topic to address these students had a few ideas to get this movement into action just exposing people of color and white people to each other enough to the point that we respect everybody equally and it'll be easier to put yourself in the shoes of the person that you are offending and then hopefully people won't do it anymore. Both students feel equality is something that needs to be given more attention in our country. Whether it's your looks, how much money you have, kind of where you are mentally. I mean everybody's different, I understand that, but we're also all just people. I would like people to know that just because you are not the minority doesn't mean that you can treat them unfairly and unequally. They are people just like you are. They're not less than you. We are equal and we're here and we're staying. Marco Tamez is a member of the Lipan Apache Band of Texas and is an associate professor in the Indigenous Studies program at the University of British Columbia. She is our guest on today's Fronteras at Changing America. Professor, welcome to Fronteras. Well, I'm glad to be here. You know, you are from my neck of the woods. I was born in South Texas in Brownsville, mm -hmm. and that is where the Lipan brand, uh, the Lipan Apache tribe is from. Can you tell me a little bit about your upbringing in South Texas in well, that area? Sure. Well, I was born in Austin. My mother and father were both at the University of Texas. My mother was a nurse. My father was attending college after he uh, left the Air Force. And so about half of us were born in Austin. However, my mother and father are both from South Texas and the lower Rio Grande. And that is really uh, what I consider the, the heart of Liban Apache territory, uh, a very big territory that is that expands beyond the state of Texas. What was your upbringing like being in a, mm. in a community that's predominantly Latino, Hispanic, Mexican-American? Were mm. you often confused for being Mexican-American? Well, I think, um, you know, that uh, 20th century identity politics in South Texas and the Southwest in general, for Native people, indig indigenous peoples, uh, raised in the 60s, I was born in the 60s and the 50s and 40s, we were raised in a world that was going through tremendous social change. And so my parents and grandparents were raised in a time period in their own respective times when very different sort of politics were occurring for and against indigenous peoples and their recognition of their, their, their beingness, their presence, and how they belong to the land. In my generation, you have to recall, you know, we were raised 
under the, the sort of specter of the Vietnam War, Johnson, Kennedy, you know, the, the lasting legacy of some of those policies is what really imprinted the Mexican-American legal identity in that space. And so indigenous peoples, you know, we say there were six flags over Texas, but indigenous peoples in our region could say, well, there were probably eight, nine, ten, or eleven flags that have come and gone. But indigenous peoples have been there from the beginning and stayed and still are there today. We belong. We remain. We haven't gone anywhere. We're still there. What made you become passionate to follow the story of Native Americans, of indigenous people? Because, you know, growing up, you probably got to explore the world. You went to your undergrad mm -hmm. school at UT. What made you decide that you wanted to pursue a career in indigenous people? Well, I'd never really decided uh, from the outset that I was going to pursue a career in indigenous studies. Um, as you know very well, being yourself a native from the region, um, there was no indigenous studies. And to this day in South Texas and in the major university systems, there really are no native studies or indigenous studies programs in our region. Now the University of Texas Austin has an, a relatively new native studies program. But when we were growing up, there was no native studies. In fact, many of my elders argued even recently in, in legal cases that civil rights never came to South Texas nor to native peoples, indigenous peoples. So it's still, we're living in a society which has dual or even triple systems in which indigenous peoples are navigating and negotiating. So I think my passion was born really at the kitchen table in community, at community gatherings and feast days and rituals that, that my elders still carried out. That is what really, I think, um, you know, sparked a passion for stories, for histories that I never saw or heard in the classroom, and to carry forward this passion for justice. I think many peoples around the world, not only indigenous peoples, have a very strong sense of there are still some things that have not yet been addressed in their people's histories. And I think that history, um, my life through songs, my family um, were very animated with songs and um, even our religious traditions, um, navigating traditional as well as the, the Catholic Church. Indigenous peoples have many ways of telling our stories and so I, I really felt like our stories were absent and um, because there are so many injustices that I witnessed in my life and, and the stories that come down often speak about injustices that had not yet been addressed. I think that is really what inspired me to write and to think more about these problems and the absence of systems that honor and, and, and where students are raised in, in a culture and society that recognizes the legitimacy and the productivity, the contributions that our cultures and our societies make to the United States and more broadly to the Americas. You recently spoke at the J. Paul Taylor Symposium here in Las Cruces. What message did you bring to the symposium? Well, um, the, the symposium organizers asked me to come to visit, to, uh, to share some knowledge and experiences that I've had in the last decade with regard to specifically cases that um, my mother specifically and our community members brought forward to address mass dispossession. This occurred, of course, many people are aware and some are not, that in 2006 and 2007, the United States government, the Department of Homeland Security, enacted a broad waiver which began the process for the government to take community lands, to take individual properties, community properties, collective properties, in order to construct the border wall. And so for the last decade, I've been focused on working with community um, you know, creating interview sessions, opportunities for community members to give their story about their experience, not only in the context of the border wall and dispossession, but more specifically what happened in that time period was very interesting to me, is that many of our elders in their 80s and 90s were triggered by the wall. And their triggering effect is what became so important in being able to bring their testimonies of deep intergenerational memory of dispossession that predated the current period of time. So three generations before 
three generational collections of stories and knowledge about other time periods when indigenous peoples in the Texas-Mexico border region had been involved in collective social justice processes, uh, creating our own mechanisms for determining right and wrong. And many of these stories were completely erased in American history and Texas history. And so we took these stories to international courts, the Inter-American, uh, the uh, United Nations in Geneva, and, and most importantly, we created a new social justice space in the community. And so they invited me to come and speak about my own experiences in the last year or the last 10 years specifically, in addressing with the community the social injustices, not only in the present time, but what are those histories and stories that underlie the dispossession by the wall? And what is the connection between the past and the present in order for us as society members, civil society, educators, students, everyday people from all walks of life to understand that if we don't understand the past, if we neglect that past, we will be doomed to repeat those same mistakes. And, and for many people who are very vulnerable in our society today, that could be the difference between life and death, literally. And that is what we are addressing uh, most um, you know, assertively in, in what we wanted to bring together in the symposium. It's an opportunity for people to share those stories and for researchers and community members to come together in order to be able to create maybe possibly some new frameworks um, in, in education that are meaningful c for communities. Do you feel like your voice is being heard? That you are getting your due day in court of society to let them know where you come from and why you're passionate about this? Today I feel yes. Um, I think that uh, the voice of Lipan Apache women who are really at the core of the contemporary movement for social justice and for more than social justice with regard to the wall, but a social justice and a uh, commemorative process. A commemorative process that involves understanding and clarifying history. To clarify history means it involves bringing forward peoples who don't ordinarily have access to juridical spaces, to tribunals, in other words, to everyday legal processes to be able to afford attorneys, to be able to um, translate their knowledge, their community-based knowledge, into more formal types of knowledge. Um, and so um, I do believe that the work that the Liban Apache women, my mother, through her cases, other actors such as academics and lawyers and uh, volunteer organizations, church organizations, um, all of these groups came together I think because there is such a serious um, evasion or um, a distortion and a sort of negation of the impact of large state processes on everyday ordinary people, not only indigenous peoples, as many people know who've been following the case against the wall and, and the problems with these large um, architectures that contain human, human beings and human communities, um, as well as the environmental communities, the, the non-human uh, sentient communities, right? Um, all of these issues um, really galvanized together when we were able to bring forward alternative social justice spaces. In other words, community meetings, community gatherings, socials, feasts, for people to be able to come together and in front of you know, legal experts, in front of academics, taking the notes, many volunteers, to give their testimony about their everyday lives and why they feel they have something to contribute of value for all society and, and that every American and citizen can learn something really crucial about how they live but mostly are resilient in these kinds of conditions and, and at the same time how can we as American citizens, as native communities really come together to understand that at these borders are American lives that have equal value to all American lives and they have something to contribute that actually goes deep in time before the American, the United States and the North American experience even um, came to pass. Um, so, so the deeper histories of 
survival, but also thriving in cataclysmic times. You know, these are the stories that indigenous peoples have to offer and the knowledge systems indigenous peoples bring to pass. And um, that, um, again, you know, my, my passion is uh, knowing that indigenous people's knowledge has something vital and absolutely crucial to contribute to solve some of the world's most vexing problems today. I'm going to ask you a question that has no easy answer, but what do you feel is the story of Native Americans today, of the indigenous? I live in the Seal Territory in British Columbia, which is a community that is also divided by the U.S.-Canadian border. What that means is a good number of the Okanagan people, in, uh, which is how they are referred to in the, in the territory, live in Washington state. And a good number of them live to the north of the border in British Columbia. And I see similar patterns of injustices, of erasures, of um, disregard for indigenous peoples who still continue to, to survive and persist under these conditions in our contemporary you know, geopolitical um, context. And I see uh, in Canada there have been significant tribunals that have emerged in the last decade. For example, the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which uh, came about as a result of many indigenous peoples coming forward to make their testimonies, to make their voices heard on the issue of indigenous or Indian residential schools. The United States has a, a very important parallel uh, history in the Indian native boarding school and mission school and other, um, other types of school or educational uh, systems and institutions. Um, the United States, however, has a very different sort of social dynamic which prevents indigenous peoples from being able to bring forward their historical claims. The statutes of limitation is an issue that, that um, indigenous peoples have been really, really impacted by. So I see that we're in a time where across borders, just here in our region, Mexico, the United States, and Canada, we have an opportunity today to really be able to, to understand that indigenous peoples who have survived historical genocide, historical trauma, and who are carrying intergenerational trauma have much to offer contemporary society in, in order for us to understand why is it that Native peoples in our, in our dominant perception seem to be at the margins or seem to be not heard or not, not seen. But from the indigenous people's perspective, it is, it's completely opposite. Indigenous peoples, we, we live every day amongst dominant society. We participate in many different institutions and systems. However, uh, we are marginalized. There's a difference from being, you know, perceiving oneself as a victim, you know, the victim identity, and, and being structurally and systematically marginalized off of the, you know, at the edge of the camera, at the edge of the media at the edge of, you know, sort of the dominant ways in which we understand what is reality, right, every day. So I think that what's happening, one of the biggest uh, important and exciting things that we need to know about indigenous peoples is that indigenous peoples, I think, are at the forefront of transforming paradigms, transforming science transforming technology, transforming social media, transforming law, transforming international human rights. Indigenous peoples in the last 30 years have been at the forefront of the international movement to really grapple with uh, some of the most vexing problems of our time than human rights abuses, as well as issues in the environment, issues with the protection of water for future generations, sustainability, um, space, um, there's no limit. So indigenous peoples bring uh, many perspectives and diverse um, approaches to problem solving that again have been pushed at the margin because at, you know, at the core of indigenous people's paradigms, at the center is a deep commitment to the principles of balance. Balance. You know, not overstepping and not overtaking anything because there's a finite limit 
to earth, to the resources we all must share together. So I think that those are the kinds of, um, those are the kinds of frameworks and foundations that humanity, beyond indigenous peoples, humanity needs today is to understand new or old that are now revitalized frameworks for sustainability for all of our future generations. Many of us are very familiar with the oral history of indigenous people, of Native Americans. But for you, you add poetry to it. Where does that come from? Well, the poetics, my mother tells me from an early age, I, as a, a, a child raised in the 60s and 70s in South Texas, where um, in my lifetime, I lived through segregation. Although, as I said before, civil rights became a legal structure. Civil rights never came to El Calaboz. El Calaboz means the dungeon. And that is a signal of a long history of colonization in our region that has still not ended to this day. So growing up, I was in between. I was the first in my family to not be raised and educated in the Catholic school. My, two, my older siblings were. I was not. My parents um, were opening up at the time. People were trying to open up in society. So I was the first in my family to go to a public school. And what that meant was, well, I was crossing over this bridge. Of course, you know, for generations and generations, indigenous peoples had come under, you know, the institution of Catholicism. But we did not have much experience going into public, public schools that were dominated mostly by non-Catholic peoples and educators. And so I experienced a lot of um, physical, mental, psychological, and emotional, I would, today we would call that abuse. I was that first child to go into that, that space. And I have scars on my body to show some of those physical encounters. So again, we have to understand that in the 60s, there was no protection for us. There was no recognition that we also were going to be encountering some very difficult and new kinds of one-on-one -on -one encounters with a, a society that was not ready and not willing for integration to occur. So I think orality in the home, you know, stories was always penetrating my mind, my spirit, my consciousness. I was the first one to start filling out forms for my elders so that I could go into different groups. So I was the one, I would say, between the oral, those who were raised dominantly in the oral tradition, and those of us who were creating that bridge into this new world of desegregating these institutions. And so because I wanted to participate, I wanted to be in soccer, I wanted to be, you know, in all of the activities of the children, in the Brownie Scouts, in the choir, I wanted to be fully participating. I was the one filling out all of these forms as well. So I learned to write. Do you feel that, that Americanized you in a way? It was a huge Americanization process. And so that's the pl that is the place where I think many uh, indigenous communities, many, and today, um, and historically, many um, Mexican indigenous and Mexican migrant communities that those children who really bear the brunt, they bear that, that they carry that load of really Americanizing their families' experiences in these uh, communities and societies that have a long history of being antagonistic or resistant to being side by side with um, peoples who are different, but peoples who have, in fact, a very long history of being in place and have a deep history of belonging to place. It's embedded within our blood. It's embedded within our memory. It's embedded within our spirit. And so those edges and those tensions, I think, um, had in, really inspired me to learn how to speak English. You know, I did not speak English when I began school. I, I what language did you speak? 
I think I spoke many languages because in our community there is Nahuatl, there is Apache, there is Comanche, there are other uh, local like Purepecha sort of linguistic which I have been researching for years. Uh, what was this language? And of course the Spanish that we spoke in community which was um, not very well accepted. I remember when I went to uh, high school and I would try to speak the language that I heard growing up, my Spanish teacher, my, my Spanish teacher uh, remarked to me that that was, you know, that was not Spanish. No. But I realized that our ancestors who intermarried with my, my mother's Nahuatl maternal ancestors were Basque and they did not speak. Spanish and their households. They spoke Basque. And so this deeper history of the peopling and the, the intercultural coming together in the river, the Rio Grande, is a place and one of my uncles, Enrique Madrid, who is Humano Apache, always uh, taught us that the river is a place where all the people came together. And when the European people came, this is how we taught them about how we are, what our governance system is about, is about peace building, is about keeping the peace, not about you know defining ourselves through warfare. It is about defining ourselves through very disciplined peacekeeping to manage and co-manage all of the resources, all of the gifts that we have been given here to take care of through our oral tradition and how we understand a relationship to our lands. Professor Margot Tamas, I want to thank you very much for joining us on Fronteras of Chiching America. Thank you. you are with the Lipan Apache Band of Texas. I want to wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much, Edmundo. Thank you for joining us on Fronteras of Chiching America. Have a pleasant week. <laughs>